Hello everyone. My name's Dr. Caroline Heim and I am a lecturer in theatre. And with me is Dr. Christian Heim, who is a clinical psychiatrist. And tonight we have a bit of a treat for you. We are looking at The Queen's Gambit, a psychoanalysis. The Netflix series. The Netflix series. The game. The game. Everything. The drama. <laughs> from here to Russia. The intrigue. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, did you did you like the series? I was hesitant at first. I know you were. <laughs> <laughs> you had to be talked into it. <laughs> well, as a psychiatrist, I found it hard to warm to the people. Yeah. And so I started looking at all the problems. However, by the end, and particularly what they did with the last episode, just... I found really interesting, found really warming, and I suppose that's why we're doing this, because yeah. there are some really worthwhile things that I believe the series says. That's right. Did you like it? Uh, I did, and I didn't, yeah. You did and you didn't? I did and I didn't, so yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, so in a way, they're two opposites. Yes. Okay, that need to be reconciled. Yeah. But you see, our mind is big enough to have those sort of opposites, like having a left brain and a, light, and a right brain. We can have order and chaos all at the same time, objective and a, a objective and subjective. And I suppose that's what I want to do. I want to talk about how um, this series talks about those disparate elements in Beth Harmon's mind and in her personality. Yes, I know. That's what we want to... Actually, we're talking about two of your very favourite subjects, psychoanalysis. And chess. Chess. Christian loves chess. Christian loves chess. <laughs> Christian used to play tournament chess. Uh, he used to be a C grade player. Uh, just like, face up, face up. Yeah, no, that's right, that's right. Just, just like the writer of the, the novel that it's based on, Walter Tevis was a C grade chess oh, really? player. Yes, he played tournaments in Kentucky. Of where all he grew places. up. That's right. Okay. That's right. All so right. It's, it's not autobiographical, but um, obviously he uses his own experience in what he's talking about. Okay, so how are we going to get into this as far as the psychoanalysis is concerned? All right, I know I call it a psychoanalysis, but it's not going to be that heavy. It's going to be a bit fun. There are a few things that I want to say that'll sound a bit like psychobabble, but they're kind of true, all right? Uh, but we're going to get into it through chess. Yeah. And I want to start talking about the way that the chess pieces move. And this is not a lesson in chess, all yeah. right? We're talking about a few things that people don't usually talk about. So let's say the rook. Yeah. Most people know that it moves straight one way or the other. Mm -hmm. Because it is straight, it is a straight down the line sort of a character, it symbolizes reason as opposed to the bishop. Now the bishop isn't called the bishop everywhere. Some languages call it the fool. French, for example. Really? The fool. Yeah, that's Ooh. right. Because it's crazy. It's mad. What it does is it goes on the diagonals. There's nothing straight about it. <laughs> it's wonky. It. It's wonky. That's yeah. a really good way of thinking about it. Yeah. So all chess pieces are based on the straight and the wonky. Yes. Okay. Or reason and emotion. Mm. So let's take the knight. The knight can move one like the rook and one like the bishop. One like the rook and one like the bishop. So it can contains a bit of reason and a bit of emotion. Yes. The queen, most powerful piece, all reason can do everything the rook can do and all emotion can do everything that the bishop can do. Mm -hmm. And the king can do exactly the same thing but only one square. But it's a combination of reason, straight and emotion to the side. Yes. So there's a lot of symbolism in chess because of that. Because it's got two opposite colours that need to be rectified because it has reason and passion combined. It's rich in symbolism. So a chessboard is not just a chessboard. This is your life. Yes. And so you've got to be in control of all 64 um, squares to win, in a sense, in your life. And the important thing about chess is you can't take a move back. Right, mm. which means that once you make a decision and you move a piece, that's it. Oh, it's so terrifying in life to do that. <laughs> but it is. Life it is, is terrifying. What if I make the right decision? Or what if I make the wrong decision? What if it wasn't the right decision? That's right. And you what can't are the take consequences? It back. That's right. And especially in the world we're living in at the moment. Yes, yes. Yeah. And there's nothing random about chess. There is, there is no dice. 
Yeah. There's, there's no just pick a card, any card. Mm -hmm. It is all decisions that need to be made. So that's why it becomes a metaphor for all of life. Okay, so let's let's tie this to the Queen's Gambit. Okay, so on the Queen's Gambit, they have two chess consultants. One of them is Gary Kasparov, world ah, champion. Yeah, Russian. He wrote a lovely book, 2007, called How Life Imitates Chess. One of your favourite books. One of my favourite books. <laughs> I've seen it on the do show. Do you know me? <laughs> I do. <laughs> <laughs> and, and this book looks at um, making decisions and yeah. what we can do to make sure we make good decisions in life. That's mm. what the book's basically about. And so the series is basically about will Beth Harmon make good decisions? Yeah. And oh, so we're on the edge of our seat. Don't, yes. don't say that again. Don't do that again. Yes, that's yeah. right. That's right. And by the end, she gets it together. Yeah. But gosh, has she got to get through ah, some bad decisions? So much angst. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And there's the tranquilizers, there are the drugs, there are all the. She steals, okay? She makes some pretty bad decisions mm -hmm. early on. Yeah. But she gets it together in the end. She does, yeah. All right, so as a way in, we're going to look at Beth Harmon's name. Mm -hmm. Now, I know not too many people. Um, believe this first off, but a lot of authors like to put meanings into the names of mm -hmm. the people, okay? Yeah. So, for example, Luke Skywalker, yeah. right? the hero of Star Wars. Yes, yes. Luke means light. Yes. Skywalker, yeah, means somebody who can walk in the sky, all right? Mm -hmm. So a great name for a hero. Yeah. Um, Darth Vader. Darth is really close to dark, dark okay? Yeah. So good name for a for a bad guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, let's take um, Catcher in the Rye, Holden Caulfield. Mm, Caulfield right. Yeah. Holden sounds like hold on. Yeah. And a call is uh, part of an amnion sac that uh, babies are born with. Yeah. Okay. And field. So it's like he wants to hold on to babies in the field. And in the Catcher in the Rye. That's what happens. That's one of the That's what things. he does. That's what he's thinking about. Yeah. So let's look at the name of Beth Harmon. Mm -hmm. Okay, give me a reading. Da, 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 da. Yes, <laughs> what is it? This is the Christian Heim interpretation of the name Beth Harmon. Beautiful name, Harmon. Yes. But it's just off harmony. Mm. She doesn't quite have harmony. She doesn't have the why. She doesn't have the why. She doesn't okay, have the why. thank you for saying that. That's all right. Because if she can find the why, yeah. then she can have harmony in her life. Ah, okay? and she's searching for this. And she's searching for <laughs> harmony. And this yeah. is not just a pun. I believe this is what Walter Tevis actually put in the character. Mm. The character has to find the why. Mm. And no spoilers, okay, but in the last episode, she finds the why to reconcile and come into harmony. Yeah. It's like beforehand, she's going... Yeah. She's sort of different. Yeah. And by the end, she finds a way to reconcile. So she's part of it. She's part of the human race, mm -hmm. okay? So what does she need to reconcile? For this, we're gonna to go to her first name. Her first name is Beth. Yes. Very close to both. Okay. Okay. So both means two sides. Mm -hmm. What does she need to reconcile? She needs to reconcile the chessboard of the light and the dark pieces. She needs to reconcile the reason and the emotion. Mm. Because early on, she's all reason. Yeah. And it's like she doesn't have any emotions or she keeps them really tucked aside. Yeah. And so that's that's one of the things that she has to reconcile. Mm -hmm. And she does that in the end. Mm -hmm. Okay, another opposite that she has to reconcile. Stop me when you get really bored, okay? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm just really enthusiastic I about know, this. I know, I know you love all of this. <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm really interested. Anyway, keep right. going. We're going to go to Charles, uh, Charles, Carl Gustav Jung, yeah. uh, a oh, psychiatrist. Yes, okay, yeah. And he talked about each of us having a male side and a female side. So we used to talk about men needing to get in touch with their feminine side, you know, to show emotions. All that idea came from Jung, right? So Beth needs to get in touch with her feminine side because at the beginning she is in a man's world mm. and she's doing it the man's mm. way. She mm. doesn't show emotions, mm. all right? By the last episode, however, she gets in contact with her feminine side, all right? And there's just a bit more in the whole of the series to show this because chess is a game of 
male and female elements. There's a king side and there's a queen side. Yes. And for six of the episodes, the main opening that gets played is the Sicilian defense, which is a king pawn opening. Okay. Beth plays it from white and from black. Mm -hmm. But at the very last, what does she do? She plays the queen's gambit. She gets in touch with her queen side and she plays a queen's gambit so that she is using the other side of the board. She's using mm. the other side of her personality. Mm. Mm. She is using her passion as well as her yeah. reason. So yeah. she kind of brings that together. And yeah, as, as Walter Tever said, this is a novel about brainy women. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's what he wanted to show. Smart women. Okay, smart women, you mm, bet. And mm. she's smart. Oh, yeah. But she doesn't have a life together, all right? Yeah. Until and so, the end. Yeah, so it's that journey that she takes. It's a journey that she takes to, to get to, in to, contact. And to that, for that reconciliation. The reconciliation is in her. Yeah, but I mean, it's a coming-of-age story, too. In that yes, way, it is too. a coming-of-age yeah. story, okay? Uh, but the coming-of-age story is not just her finding out about her sexuality mm. okay it's a coming of of maturity mm. she takes responsibility for herself she makes good decisions yeah gary kasparov would be proud of her by the last <laughs> episode yeah right. yeah yeah it's it's really interesting in that because we we kind of journey with her you know yeah because right? i actually got really depressed um watching some of those episodes i mean we yeah. didn't binge it we should probably should have binged it i think you have to binge this one okay um i disagree <laughs> i think you definitely have to binge it because you, you've got to you've got to go through everything okay and go through the journey um see it one, in one go at a time no think about what's going on okay what is this woman doing no do not listen to she him she's making poor decisions <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah she is end. until okay That's yeah right. yeah well she's but she's lost yeah, she is. She's That's really, right. really lost. And, I, and, and, and as you do when you're watching theatre or film, you, you identify with, with a leading character yeah. or, or you go on the journey with them um, and, and, and you get caught in those emotions because everyone was saying how great the show was and I was getting more and more depressed as I was watching it. Because you were feeling lost? There was that sort of lostness. Um, there were a few other elements, um, but yeah, yeah, definitely the lostness. Yeah. Okay, so uh, let's talk about her her drug use and her yeah. her alcoholism. Okay, yeah. so <clears throat> that was where she was putting her emotions. Yeah, because she wasn't facing her emotions. Yeah, she needed to integrate that, which is what she does in the last episode. Mm. Okay. Uh, before that, she was basically drinking to forget. Yeah. Which brings me to another thing that she needed to integrate, her past and her present, mm. okay? And she, she would, uh, this is the way I see things, obviously, all right, you know, sort of, uh, I, I don't know what the producers were, talk, uh, <laughs> were, were thinking, but this is the way that I saw things, yeah. okay? And the last episode, she, we see more of her past, and yeah. it's like she understands more of her past. Mm. And she cries over her past mm. and she goes, oh my gosh, okay, this is me. Mm. And because of that, she becomes a more mature person, more complete if you like, mm. all right? And mm. I believe that's why some of the things happened that happened in that last episode. Yeah, there was that depth of grief there, wasn't there? And, but it was, it was cathartic too, though. I mean, I certainly felt that. Yes, Yeah. yes, mm. yes, she needed to go through that catharsis, I believe, mm. to get to the more integrated person that she actually was. Mm. It wasn't just the, the, the drugs that kept her emotions <clears throat> inside. Did you like her clothing? I loved her clothing. I, I want some of those clothes. <laughs> the 1960s style. Yeah, I loved it. And I, I mean, so. and she, was, she, she loved it too. I mean, she, she was certainly, that was a part of her, her character. It was a coming of age part. I mean, she was... She was making up for, for things that she didn't get, okay? So it was a yeah. part of that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, When she was laughed at when she was at school and such. But, yeah, I, I love the clothes, yeah. You look great in the clothes. <laughs> in fact, if we could find that jacket, okay? But... Oh, wasn't that jacket amazing? <laughs> oh, my gosh. All right, but <clears throat> her clothing uh, was part of her false self, yeah. okay? So the true self, which we get to see in films and many yeah. series, uh, is our insides, what actually goes through in our thought life, mm. right? But we don't show that to everybody. We show people our false self. Yeah. <clears throat> we kind of construct a character mm. and we say, 
look, this is me, this is me, don't look behind the mask, but yeah, right. Yeah. And that only works for a while. And by again, the last episode, she makes some discoveries about herself. She looks herself square in the face, okay? Because mm. she, she sees some friends that are getting their act together. There's one friend who, oh, they're in medicine, medicine school. Another friend, oh, I'm going to become a lawyer. Mm. She goes, oh, oh, am I getting my act together? Mm. And she starts making decisions so that her life moves forward yeah. the way that it should. So that's another thing she had to get together. Her true self, which is mm -hmm. her inner yes. world, and her false self, which was the clothing in the outer world. Yeah, it's so true, though, because she was... It was almost she was propped up by that. And then you yeah, saw yeah. it getting broken down gradually. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. But the friends, what about the friends? Well, see, that yeah. was another beautiful journey because along the way she, okay, uh, I got to say in the first couple of episodes, she's a real user, all right? She, yeah. she does not treat people very well. Okay? Yeah, well, she hasn't learned to. That's right. She's had no modelling there. There's That's no right. childhood template for her, you know. That's right. But by the end of the series, there are a few friends that come to her rescue because they genuinely care for her. Mm. And that was kind of foreign to her. Yeah. And so then at the end, we, we realised that she couldn't do this by herself. Mm. And this is another theme that was going through that I saw anyway. Yeah. <clears throat> you had the American individualism, right? The individual, the hero is going yeah, to yeah. win. And then we had the Soviet collectivism, where even the rival chess players would get together and help each other out in a situation. Yeah. And so she actually then had a group of friends get together and help her out, mm. analyze the situation so that she knew what to do. Mm. So mm. there was a balance. Of course, she did it by herself, mm. but she couldn't do it without her friends either. And that's another thing we've all got to reconcile. We can be ourselves, but if our friends are playing a different tune and so we're out of harmony, uh, we're going to stick out like a sore thumb, yeah. right? Whereas if you can be yourself, but do it in harmony with your friends and the people around you, Life just sounds so much better. It does. And that's what came through at the end of the series. Yeah, but she took a long while to open up to that and to be able to let, basically to let that in because she built such a hard shell. Yeah, I was wondering about that hard shell yeah. because this is something that I found really annoying at the mm. beginning. And as a psychiatrist, I'm concerned that people are not letting their emotions show. Yeah. And I just got really concerned that the actor wasn't showing any emotions. It was, it was like... The actor was deadpan. Well, she'd been directed that way, obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I also think that reflects things in society. And I was going to ask you about that, but I do want to yeah, talk yeah, yeah. about how she was directed because no, we'll get back to that. Um, it's something that I talk about in one of my lectures to my students where we go back to um, the, the f friends, friends of the 1990s with Jennifer Aniston yeah. um, and the sort of acting that was... Uh, what I call dispassionate acting. Okay, so there's the blank sort of look, which of course is read as very cool and, and very, you know, funny, of course, in Friends. They used it for comedy in Friends. Okay. Um, uh, and, uh, and she would hold that face, uh, 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 Aniston, and it, it was wonderful because her timing was impeccable if you ever look at any of those series. And then the laughter, I mean, it was canned laughter, but the, the laughter would come in. And um, from that point on, um, that actually set the tone for some of the acting. And so actors, particularly in film and, and in sitcoms and television, took that up and embraced that and um, became um, gradually, you know, uh, less passionate in their performances. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I often have to teach my students, OK, um, you don't get any, a reward for, for having a blank stare on stage, particularly on stage, because you've really got to know your emotions. Acting is, is a... It uses the language of emotions, yeah. and that's what we trade in is emotions as actors. So it really is important for them to get in touch with their emotions. And so this was really interesting for me because she'd been clearly directed to be even further than the sort of blank sort of um, look for, 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 the, for the comic moment and for the gag. This was a drama, okay, and she was dispassionate, okay, and she was playing in that man's world, okay, and, and it was really a really strong choice, but one that was sort of really almost nihilistic. It was, it was really, had a hopelessness to it. Um, and it's sort of, ah, oh, you know. The, yeah, yeah. yeah, well, I get really concerned about that because yeah. what you said uh, rang, rings true, okay, yeah. that there's this nihilism. And I'm 
really concerned about the nihilism in today's age. And yeah. because celebrities and the way that we present our media yeah. has such an impact, such an impact on how yeah. people lead their That's lives, right. that people are actually going to think this is the way I'm supposed to be as a person. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to replicate this. This is something to, to, to aspire to. Yeah, so if you're dispassionate, um, I'm sorry, a relationship just is not going to be as... Nah, the way a relationship is supposed as to intense. be. <laughs> as intense, that's yeah. right. Mm. Uh, and so, but I think that the producers were playing a game with this. Yeah, yeah. All right. I think so, yeah. Because what they did was they tapped into what people think that they like, the dispassionate acting, mm. and then at the end, they turned it around mm. because she mm. became warm. Mm. She cried. She felt for people. People were looking her in the eye and saying, this is your game. And she was touched. That's right. She was actually touched. And that's when you felt, well, I felt as a psychiatrist, that she came alive, that she came out of her shell and started to live as yeah, a person. I think she did. I think I would track it to that moment where she was on the phone and, and she was getting the second. Spoiler alert. <laughs> and she said, Benny. And it was just that moment. I mean, it was such a beautiful moment because that's where the warmth came. Ding, right. right into the voice, right into the emotion. She held it beautifully, the actress. Yeah. Um, and it was just that one moment. Okay. Yeah. You've got a friend. Mm, yeah. I've got a friend. Yeah. We've got friends. Yeah. We're not in this world alone. Yeah. And so many people feel alone. Mm. And Beth Harmon looked alone yeah. for the whole of the series. At the end, you feel that she's grown out of that. Yeah. And she's making good decisions now. She made decisions to integrate her true self and her false self, yeah. her individualism with her friends all yeah. around her. She's a feeling person as well as a thinking person, okay? And she got in contact with her female elements as well as her male yeah. elements. So you feel that she is more complete. So she's integrated. Do you believe she's fully integrated using psychoanalysis? Um, well, to be fully yeah. integrated in your early 20s is a bit of, a, <laughs> bit of an ask, right? Yeah. But, yeah, I think Gary Kasparov uh, would be proud of her because she started <laughs> to make good decisions, yeah. right? Um, she's still got a lot of life to lead. Yeah. But in the journey that they took us through, she got through it. Yeah. Okay? Uh, she actually said no to some drinks at the end, okay? Yeah, and we're all on the edge of our seat. Is she, isn't she? Yeah, that's right, yeah. we're wondering. <laughs> Beth, don't blow this. Make yeah. a good decision. Very good job. Take responsibility. Great tension there. Yeah, yeah great mm. tension. Mm. And, yeah, yeah. Spoiler alert, but... It's all right, don't worry. Everyone will have watched it, Christian. Okay, but she made good decisions. <laughs> Whereas early on, she was not making good decisions. Yeah. And that's what chess is about. Chess is about finding always the right move because you can't take it back. When you marry somebody, when you um, give yourself to somebody, when you decide I'm going to do this rather than that, yeah. there are decisions that you can't take back. But you can look to make sure that you've got all the right reasons and all the right feelings behind the decision so that you make the best decision for you. Yeah. You don't have to be a world champion at anything. Mm. You just have to be the best you that you can be. Mm. And even that means making good decisions. Great. Yeah, so. So, that's what we, I mean, it's, it's a game of life, isn't it? And so is the Queen's Gambit. It's a game of life, it's a game of chess, but it was also a game of how to market this so that this would become a success and yet bring something worthwhile yeah. to people to make them think. So, mm -hmm. if we can be in harmony with the people around us, if we can integrate our reason and our passion, yeah. our true and false self, yeah. our male and female sides, and be ourselves while be together while we're together in pe uh, with people. You know what I mean. Have friends. I do. Right? I do. Blah, 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 blah. Well, <laughs> I'm glad you understand. Okay. Yeah. Then instead of clashing with people around, which feels horrible, we start getting more in harmony with the people around. And when we're in more harmony, we can start making beautiful music. This has been Dr. Caroline Heim and Dr. Christian Heim. Enjoy the Queen's Gambit.